everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Marcus de Sotoy. Hi Marcus. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. Just a little introduction. Marcus is the Simonyi Professor for the Pro Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University, quite a mouthful. Uh, he's also a prize-winning professor of mathematics, a fellow of New College, and a fellow of the Royal Society. He's the author of several prize-winning books, and his latest is The Creativity Code, How AI is Learning to Write, Paint, and Think, which is a super exciting topic. So Marcus, we gotta start with, uh, why is a maths professor writing a book about creativity? I know some people might find that difficult. Yes, I, I think uh, usually the words maths and creativity uh, don't uh, go together if you're not a mathematician. But if you're a mathematician, actually, um, it's a very important part of our work. And I think um, it, it goes to the heart of the fact that we're making a lot of choices, actually, when we're creating our mathematics. Uh, we don't want to just create mathematics that's true, because quite often that's boring. We try to choose mathematics which takes our uh, the people who attend our seminars, the people who read our papers in our journals, on a kind of emotional journey. Uh, we want to transform them, to change them, to make them go, oh, I didn't realize uh, those two things were connected. Um, and so in, in charting out that kind of journey, um, it requires a lot of choice, aesthetics, and creativity, because you're having to go to places which are new. So, you know, what is creativity? I, I defined it in this new book as... Um, something which is new, but that's not just good enough because, um, you, you know, that, that could be very boring. So it's got to be surprising and it's got to have some sort of value. It's got to kind of um, be worthwhile in some way. And I think that's what a mathematician is trying to do, create new kind of truths about numbers, geometries. But it, it's got to be surprising. It's got to kind of move you in some way. And if it's got value as well, then that really, uh, you know, wins the biscuits. Um, <laughs> so creativity is something which is very important to me as a mathematician, perhaps more than a scientist. I mean, scientists have to be quite creative, but they're kind of bound very often by the physical universe that we live in. As a mathematician, I've got much more freedom, actually, to be uh, imaginative in my world, create new worlds that perhaps aren't physical. And I think that's much closer to being a, an artist than a scientist. Yeah, and it, I love this emotional journey of mathematics and your book does that really well. I'm not someone who reads mathematics books much, but this is not, this is kind of crosses the boundaries, which is fantastic. So let's come to AI because um, I really discovered AI in a big way when AlphaGo beat the Girl, Go World Champion. And I read in your book that that moment was pivotal for you as well. So let's just revisit that. Why was that such a big deal in 2016? It was a big deal, especially for me as a mathematician, because um, I've always used the game of Go as a good analogy for doing mathematics. I think a lot of people thought chess was quite a good analogy. And, you know, the, the, a computer beat the world champion at chess in the mid 90s. Um, but I think uh, what's uh, why Go is more is closer to being a mathematician is it. You're not quite sure why you make certain moves. It requires a little bit of intuition, pattern recognition, um, a bit of creativity. And so for me, I'd always use that game as a kind of protective shield against the idea that AI could do mathematics. Um, so I watched this game uh, with a lot of a kind of angst and uh, existential angst. And um, But for me, the most significant thing was not just that this computer managed to beat a world champion at this very complex game. There was a moment in game two where the computer made a move. It's move 37. And I talk about it in the book because I think this is a kind of uh, uh, a, a pivotal moment. When all the commentators went, oh, it's made a mistake because it was doing something that you're taught as a Go player never to do, which is to play on a, on a kind of particular line on this 19 by 19 grid. But as the game evolved, uh, we realized that it wasn't a mistake. It was a deeply incitive move. It was incredibly creative because it was new, surprised us, and it had value because it ultimately won game two for the AI. So I think for me, that was one of the most exciting things. It it enabled us to see how to play the game in a completely new way. So it was being creative. But not only that, the way this thing had been programmed was significantly different. And I think this is why there's a real kind of phase change in AI. I mean, it's like water going to steam boiling. Um, because this computer 
had not been sort of the program hadn't been written by a sort of human and the human knew what it was doing. The human had written the program so the program could learn, adapt and change. And so ultimately, by the end of the, all the training it did, we actually didn't know how it was making its decisions, why it was making its decisions. And this new AI, which we call machine learning, because it it learns how to program itself. A bit, it's a bit like a child uh, who's born um, and in the past the child had nowhere to kind of learn on. But suddenly we've got this new AI, a child which can learn by interacting with its environment, change and become sing- something uh, more than its parents, as it were. Mm. And then uh, what happened after that AlphaGo beat the human? Um, well, uh, uh, I, I want... Um, you're obviously thinking about something. So yeah, then. well, I mean, as in uh, okay. the, the next iteration of AlphaGo, I can't remember what it's called, right? It's called Alpha Zero. Oh, yes. This is um, because in some ways AlphaGo had been given the rules of the game um, and had been given human games to play on. So it learned from what we'd done as humans. And so you feel, OK, well, it's extending our uh, intelligence and creativity. But then uh, DeepMind, who developed AlphaGo, um, developed something called Alpha Zero, mm. where they just gave the um, computer the 19 by 19 uh, grid, the pixels, and a score. Um, and it had to learn how to play the game, the rules of the game. And so this was a kind of tabula rasa learning. It didn't know anything. Um, by the end of its uh, evolution, it was actually better than the Alpha Go that had beat Lee Sedol. So um, this, I think, is genuinely exciting because um, it didn't have to learn from things we'd already learnt. It, it started from zero. Uh, I mean, that's almost true creativity, you know, uh, something from nothing. Um, so it, it, it's, it's very interesting it was able to do that. I'm, I'm quite surprised that um, without any sort of, sort of guidance, that it reached such a phenomenal level. And actually, it even learned to play chess in an afternoon and beats all the computers that are programmed to chess and also a kind of uh, Chinese version of chess. So um, th- this is uh, exciting and perhaps a little bit scary for some people. And I think, you know, some people will now be listening going, oh, yeah, but it's still like a game. It's still Go. It's still chess. But give us some examples of how AI is also creating in the, you know, the music and the writing and all these different things that is already happening. Yes, I I mean, I agree with you. It it looks a nice closed um, uh, sort of environment, the game of Go, and and it is. And I think that's why it was a good place to start. But now this AI, if it can learn, well, why not expose it to other things, not just games of Go, um, but the art that we love, the the, the novels we like to write, the poetry, uh, the, the music. And music is an interesting one because it's also quite a sort of uh, in, um, self-contained environment. Um, if you think about it, it's uh, it's got notes on page, certain frequencies. That's why there's a lot of connection between maths and music. Um, so AI learning on what we've composed in the past and extending it um, has been very successful. So somehow uh, AI always starts with Bach as the composer because... Um, <laughs> So they try and sort of make more Bach, um, partly because Bach is very algorithmic in the way that he writes his music. And I think that's one thing I wanted to illustrate in the book, that um, artistic creativity um, isn't as kind of mysterious as we think it is, um, that actually there's a lot of kind of structure, pattern, almost algorithm in the way that we do our creation of pieces of art. And so the book is partly showing why actually we're responding to things in the kind of artistic realm because they are they've got that kind of hidden structure that we're trying to unpick so if we can understand that then maybe the ai can go uh, and sort of extend um that into other realms so we've now got examples for example a, a jazz improviser trained on another jazz musician's uh, riffs um, uh, the AI learnt ha- those riffs, but then extended um, the kind of uh, sound world of this jazz musician. Uh, and what's interesting there is the jazz musician said, look, I recognize what this AI is producing. It's, it's my world, but it's doing things I never thought were possible. Mm. So I think this is an example of the exciting role that AI can play in a, in a creative's life, because 
it's as if that jazz musician was stuck in a corner of the room with just a small light on, didn't realize that they were sitting in a huge, great big hall. And the AI has turned the lights on and showed, well, look, look at all these other places that you can go to with your sound world. So, so music has been an exciting progress. Mm. Um, the art world, well, there are some curious things like um, a new Rembrandt was painted um, because uh, the AI learnt what Rembrandt had done on the in the past the sort of his use of light, um, the sort of faces that he likes to paint. And by taking that information was able to produce something which um, I think is pretty convincing as Mm. a Rembrandt-esque painting. Mm. It was sold at Sotheby's, right, as well? Oh, that's another painting. That's another one. Uh, Yes, Mm. uh, Sotheby's, um, uh, or I think it was Christie's actually, uh, was the first AI piece of art. And I think this this is, again, interesting because... You know, Rembrandt, we've already got what fantastic Rembrandt, so we don't need anything new there. So I think the, the what we want is AI to take us somewhere new and exciting, mm-hmm. not to pr- reproduce the old. Um, and this piece of AI that was sold um, at the um, at Christie's, I think it was, um, it was created actually by making art into a bit of a game because it was using something called a generative adversarial network or a GAN. Mm -hmm. And this is taking two algorithms which kind of compete against each other. So one algorithm is creating art, which it tries to make uh, new and not derivative, but not too new that you just don't recognize it as a chaotic mess. The other algorithm then says, no, I spot that. That's very Picasso-esque or, or no, you've now gone into a realm the, you know that's not art and the two competed against each other and created something which was kind of a new sort of art and, and that's what went on sale at Christie's mm. and that's that's the bit I think is just like writers I don't know about maths but I think there's this this generative of you set as you say which is the creative mind which is you know I'm back in first draft that's the first draft thing and then the uh, adversarial which uh, I, we would call critical voice or the editor is the bit that goes through and kind of says oh no that's not not so great or that needs fixing or whatever so that to me almost sounds human-like i agree with you and i think uh, i have quite a few quotes from people in the book um the painters especially uh, and and a poet uh, paul valery who talks about the fact that you need two people in your mind um one being super creative and throwing out ideas and the other one being critical and making choices about no that's not good that is good and certainly i i I do that in mathematics uh, and very often I will do that in partnership with somebody else. Um, So we have a lot of collaborations and I have partners across the world that I create my mathematics with. And sometimes I'll be the kind of good guy um, suggesting loads of mad ideas. Um, And then uh, my colleague in Germany, he's the one who shoots it down. Or I have a colleague in Israel. He's the generative one. And I'm the adversarial one in that uh, context. So I think uh, we we do use this uh, paradigm uh, quite a lot. So I think it's interesting that AI has latched onto it as a powerful way um, to to make things uh, new things. So what about writing then? Because I hear my audience saying, yes, but nobody's written and AI hasn't written anything. So tell us about the poetry, um, automated insights, you know, what, what's going on with, with writing? Well, uh, your writers will be encouraged to learn that I think of all the arts that I looked at in this book, that I think writing is still the furthest away from um, AI being able to achieve anything like humans can. I think they're writing could good uh, music and uh, and also visual art. Um, but there have been some examples. Uh, people might remember a story about um, a new Harry Potter. Um, so again, this is machine learning because what the AI took was the, you know, the seven volumes that JK Rowling has written, um, saw the sort of sentences she likes, the sort of connections she likes making, and then um, uh, produced a, kind of the beginning of an eighth volume. Um, but actually... Here's a warning about AI, because I looked under the bonnet of this piece of AI and actually ran it on my some of my own books to see whether I could um, you know, maybe I can put myself out of a job or get the AI to write my book for me. And what I understood was there's still a lot of human creativity going on in an exercise like that. Mm -hmm. So the um, the algorithm offered me at each point um, 18 different choices of words which could follow the word you've just had. And I had to choose which of those um, that I would write. So uh, 
And this is a warning because I think a lot of the news stories love to say AI has painted a new picture. AI has written the Harry Potter. And uh, it doesn't make a good news story if you say human rights with the aid of a computer. Uh, and so the, hu the human gets kind of um, put to the side uh, and it, it's sort of celebrated as a piece of AI. But I think Actually, I heard Demis Hassabis. He said a nice thing. Um, who's the was the creator of DeepMind and AlphaGo, um, and he said it's like in the turn of the century when everybody was just putting .dot com at the end of their um, companies to uh, hype their value. And at the moment, we've just got everyone putting AI, you know, made with AI, machine learning. Um, so be be warned that not everything um, is. is always AI. But, but that's to, not to say that there are roles that AI can play um, in creative writing. Um, poetry has been a very interesting uh, place because it's quite a constrained sort of um, uh, environment. Um, sometimes you, you're almost putting rules on yourself to push you into uh, kind of new ways of thinking. Um, I think that's often why I quite enjoy uh, sort of writing poetry of you know if I do because it's sort of I have to think of something that matches what I've just done if I'm trying to keep a particular rhythm going um mm. so there have been some interesting examples and I suppose they're more successful because poetry has always had a kind of gnomic quality that you're never quite sure what on earth this means and so I think AI can get away with a lot in this environment because it can write something um, which, you know, you can think, well, that sounds kind of weird. And it could easily be sort of human going off on some weird kind of path. So I, I reference a little exercise um, uh, that you can do, uh, which is trying to spot whether something's written by a bot or, or not. Um, and it's uh, somebody's put forward some different uh, uh, poems composed by humans, which actually sound quite machine like and vice versa. Um, uh, but yeah, I suppose there's. Um, uh, I think the most interesting have been uh, some exercises. Uh, some of your writers might have been involved in the uh, November writing month. Yes, um, NaNoWriMo, yeah. NaNoWriMo, exactly. My mum my has done a couple of nano, uh, uh, NaNoWriMo's. Um, but somebody came up with a cunning idea. So this is to write a novel in the month, uh, you know, really disciplined, uh, pump out the words. Um, uh, but this was a, a kind of variant on that idea, which is, you no, know, just write a piece of AI write a bit of code that will make the novel for you. So you spend the month not writing, but coming up with code that will do the writing for you. Um, so there have been some very interesting examples of that. And, and most of them, again, are quite derivative. They're taking things like Moby Dick and running it through a Twitter filter. Um, but I thought one of the most interesting was uh, one by somebody called Thrice Dotted. That's her uh, pseudonym. Um, and she wrote something called The Seeker. And this is um, the AI uh, takes uh, WikiHow, which if, if anyone's gone wiki, on WikiHow, it's you know how to um, ask a girlfriend out on a date or how to um, bake bread or how to. Um, and the coders kind of thought, well, this is I want to learn what it's like to be human. So I'm going to go through these pages of how to on, on WikiHow and learn what it is to be human. Um, and the algorithm kind of generates uh, responses to the wiki how pages. Now, for me, this is most interesting because I think this is where creativity and AI is going to be richest, which is when when AI becomes a kind of entity in its own right and it wants to try and communicate with us and we want to try and understand its world. I think, you know, why do we write novels? We write novels because we want to get inside the mind of the other or to share our minds with, with others. I think it's trying to solve the hard problem of consciousness that we can't know what it feels like to be you or, or what it feels like to be me. And our novels are almost like an fMRI scanner uh, reading into the, the brain of the other. So I think this will become most interesting when AI becomes conscious and then we will need to hear their stories in order to understand what it's like to be that machine. People are going, when AI becomes conscious, which, you know, <laughs> which, oh. not, I wasn't going to get, I wasn't going to get here so fast, but you, um, there are lots of people who worry about AI becoming conscious. Obviously, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, famous names, dystopian sci-fi writers. Um, so, and you mentioned that story might be the answer to the evil AI. So maybe just talk about that a minute. Yes, because I think that, um, uh, 
I, I think it has been a little bit too dystopian, and I'm hoping this book is actually a more positive take on AI and how AI can be a useful tool, um, but perhaps go further. And it, if it does become conscious, then we're going to need it on our side. You know, we want to work together. Um, and uh, there was an exercise uh, which um, took uh, – the, it was took the idea of how to tell a story uh, and um, actually m many of your writers might have watched Bandersnatch uh, mm. just recently, um, uh, The Black Mirror on Netflix, where you get to make choices along the way about what the characters do. And of course, this is a very old idea. Books I used to love as a kid where, you know, turn to page 37 if you go through the left door or that. Um, so actually what um, uh, the this uh team research team did was to train ai on the way that humans tell stories um uh, so we tell stories which aren't too dystopian most of the time i think uh, um or at least we tell stories about what it means to be human and then the ai having trained on this was let loose on a kind of tree of possibilities of a story to tell and what was encouraging was because it had learnt how humans tell stories it chose a pathway that um, was kind of more human-like, was, was, wasn't was um, kind of a horrific choices um, uh, which weren't kind of emotionally involved. It took a pathway that humans responded to. Mm. And so I think that if we can train uh, the AI that's emerging, in a sense, to be empathetic by reading our stories, by understanding our art, and, and therefore being sympathetic to producing something similar, um, then we might have uh, an empathetic AI will not be one that will hopefully wipe us out. And I actually put the quote by Ian McEwan, whose response to 9-11 um, was, um, uh, if, if those hijackers had been able to put themselves in the minds of uh, the passengers on those planes, would they have been able to carry out the, the, the act that they did? And I think this is Partly why we have art is to be able to to share our, our different ways of looking at the world and, and to try and to mix minds um, and, and not separate minds. Mm, I love that. I love that story might be the answer to to the whole AI thing. I just I just love it. But I did. I want to ask you just um, that some technical questions that I think uh, authors are really concerned with. So the first one is the uh, the copyright question. So we had the a new quote, the macaque selfie, the monkey selfie, which I'm sure everyone can remember. And it was um, an, anything created uh, an item created by a non-human cannot be copyrighted. So what does that mean if we're using AI as a tool? Like if I feed the AI my 17 novels and it spits out something I can use, what, what happens with copyright then? Yes, I think this is uh, uh, still a very grey area. And it's partly why um, I, I spent a couple of years on a committee at the Royal Society in London, sort of impacting, uh, looking at the impact that machine learning is going to have an AI on the future. And, and I think these legal issues are ones we just are not quite sure about yet. I mean, I think fundamental things like uh, driverless cars, if it causes an accident, who who is to blame? Is it the person who programmed the car? Is it the driver who owns the car? So I think similar issues come up with copyright. Um, uh, it, you know, if somebody writes a piece of code, but they take um, a material that the code is learning on, which belongs to somebody else, and so the the result is in a product of, say, your novels, but the bit of code written by somebody else. Um, and, and so who, who owns the, the copyright there? Um, and I think this is um, really interesting because I actually start the book with something called the Ada Lovelace Challenge. Um, because Ada Lovelace said, hey, look, uh, she was one of the first programmers, um, was interested in the idea that this – um, uh, analytical machine that um, Babbage had made might be able to do more than just ma mathematical calculations. And suggest she suggested music could be one of the things. Mm. But she cautioned and said, look, um, this will never be able to do more than the programmer who wrote it. Uh, and so that's the challenge of the book. Well, is that really true anymore? Because these things seem to be really creative. Mm. So if it's going beyond uh, the co the person who's coded the thing, it seems to be creating things which are not what the coder expected. So should that be therefore uh, belonging? Is that the, the still the coder's um, kind of uh, property? Because um, or, or should it start to be 
something else. If you think about the way movies are made, um, a movie actually is just the, generally the ownership of a movie because there are so many people involved in that. It, it generally has to be owned by a company. So it's not actually a person. It belongs to a sort of a legal identity, um, just which um, kind of deals with the fact that there are many creative processes going in. And you, you, you just couldn't pull this thing apart uh, if everyone said, but that line was my line or that. Uh, so I wonder whether we're going to get to, uh, to a similar sort of situation where we will have to recognize maybe um, some legal status for AI which will incorporate the creativity of the coder, the creativity of the things that are being learnt on. Um, but I think we're going into uh, unexplored territory here. And then I also wanted to ask about translation, because this is something I'm really super excited about, because uh, just last year, a um, a translation AI translated a non-fiction, and that's important, a non-fiction book, 100,000 words in 30 seconds into Mandarin, from English to Mandarin. And then a an editor took a week to clean that up. And it would have taken six months, apparently, to have translated with a human. So I wonder about that, because in that case, surely the AI... It, did the first draft, which is normally what an author does. And therefore, I, that just really confused me. And I'm very interested in what's going to happen with translation with AI. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, well, uh, language translation ha has been uh, high, very successful. And it, it is a great thing for machine learning to, to, to work on, because um, in the past, I suppose a translation would be, uh, you know, It'd be sort of top-down coding where you would say, okay, well, you've got a dictionary, you translate things. Um, but very often, subtlety of sentences means that just a simple translation of each word uh, using a dictionary doesn't capture it. And the language tools now are, are being very effective at really capturing the meaning of a sentence um, because they learn on the way that we uh, use language. Um, but they still are, aren't perfect. And I think that's where, you know, you said a, a human had to come in and, and tidy it up. And I think one of the things I kept on hearing when I did my research for this book um, was the, the words good enough, um, that the AI can produce music, which is good enough for, um, say, um, a, a game or a corporate video, but isn't going to be performed in the concert hall. And again, when it came to translation, the translations were good enough to communicate um, the message uh, that somebody was trying to, to write in one language. But if you really wanted um, the full subtleties, then you needed a, a human to come in. Mm. And um, there's an interesting uh, guy that I've always been very interested in called Douglas Hofstadter, who wrote uh, the book Gerd Lescher Bach. Mm. Yeah. So, um, he's actually been looking at AI for, for 50 years or so. Um, uh, but he's very down on AI uh, as far as translation goes. And, and he produced some very interesting examples which just throw a computer because they just don't understand kind of context. Um, uh, things between languages, for example, you know, in English, we don't have um, uh, his, his uh, words don't have uh, a masculine or feminine mm -hmm. form, but in French they do. And that can cause real problems when you start translating. Because if you say something like his, cur his car and her car, his um, house and her house, his book and her book, that translates very difficultly into French because, um, you know, uh, sa voiture et sa voiture. Oh, 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 right. They're both, well, where's the his and the her there? Um, so I think, uh, and you've picked up on one thing which I think is quite exciting that although computers are very good, humans are also very good. And actually, it's going to be the combination of the two which is best. So already, if you go back to the game of Go, which we already talked about, um, if you combine a human with the AI, then together they can beat certainly a human, but they can also beat the AI on its own. Um, and we've seen this also in, in medical uh, research as well. Uh, AI, one of the big things it's being used for is, is in healthcare. Um, it's able to scan pictures um, uh, and pick up tumors, for example, which are being missed by human radiographers. But again, the combination of a human and the AI seems to be better than both of them. So I'm, I'm hoping that's the future, that we're going to use this as a very powerful tool to, to speed up translation, but it won't ever be as good as a human in picking up kind of subtleties of use of language that the, the AI is just missing. 
Mm, fantastic. Well, I want to pick up uh, then, I mean, a bit earlier, you said it's a bit like when everyone stuck dot com on the end of everything. And of course, then you're probably talking 1998, 97, 98 to 2000, you know, the, the kind of the dot com boom. But of course, we are, you know, now, gosh, nearly 20 years later. And you and I are talking over the internet. I run a business on the internet. You're collaborating over the internet. And we all are in a dot com world yes, yes. so so how what do you see you know are we talking really fast change are we talking 20 years what what are, what did you conclude are you out of a job am I out of a job and how fast <laughs> well I think uh, there's a, a speed is very important here because people comparing this revolution to something like the industrial revolution which had a massive impact impact on um, work uh, and, and people's lives and caused a lot of poverty. Um, but the Industrial Revolution, I think, happened over, gener over a generation. You know, it was your son or daughter that didn't get the job that you had. I think the speed of this revolution is way faster. And I think that what we're doing now, 10 years time, we will have to be doing something completely different. So I think that we have to be ready for change. We have to know how to learn new things, um, and which I think is exciting. I enjoy uh, the challenge of, uh, of not getting stuck in my ways and having to do something new. But I think that's where AI is going to help us. I think that too often we get stuck in our ways and actually we end up behaving more like machines than the machines because we just keep on churning out the same sort of things. We get stuck in certain formulas for the way we write or the way we think. Um, and AI is being able to analyze what we're doing and suggest to us new pathways. Uh, oh, maybe you could try this. Maybe you could try that. And, you know, we might not like all the suggestions, but some of them may resonate and take us off into a new direction. So, so I, I think that's... Um, uh, the really exciting positive side of this AI, that it's going to open up um, huge possibilities in our creative process that we are, are, are kind of sitting there ready to be ignited, but we didn't know were there. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm excited too. And I, that's why I wanted to talk to you. I was like, yay, someone else is excited <laughs> about yeah. our future. <laughs> So um, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you and your book and everything you do online? Um, well, all my books uh, in the UK are published by Fourth Estate, uh, who are a wonderful publisher. I, I've loved them and stuck stuck with them all the way. Um, and I have a website. Uh, so I'm the Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science, as you said, quite a mouthful. Um, so I have a website where I put a lot of the activities that I do, radio work, um, that I archive, uh, television work, and also my books. So that's www.simone, which is spelled S-I-M-O-N-Y-I, um, dot O-X dot A-C dot U-K. Um, I'm also on Twitter, which is uh, where I kind of use as a, a micro blog. So that's mm -hmm. at Marcus DeSotoy. Thanks so much for your time, Marcus. That was great. Yeah, real pleasure.